Well, Isaiah, there are times when we, uh, we kind of have our little powwow over there. You know, we yeah. put a minute and a half of planning into these episodes, a lot, a lot of hard work, and we're like, oh, you know, maybe we talk about this, talk about that. I don't even know where to start with the sport of football, with the Buffalo Bills, with you, with Damar. So I'll, I'm just going to kind of give you the floor <laughs> and take it wherever you want. But um, I think everybody here is just thrilled to be sitting here thinking about football, watching football, talking about football, because I'm not going to lie, I think there was a point Monday night, I was there in Cincinnati up in the press box, I can't imagine it was like on the field, where I'm thinking the sport is never going to be the same mm. again, and I think everybody throughout the country was thinking that. Um, first thoughts on a night I'm sure you'll never forget for the rest <laughs> of your life. Um... Yes, leading up to it, you never thought that would that's the that's the last thing on your mind, you know, that what happened to DeMar. Um, he's doing fine now. But um um leading up into the game, like I said, it was never a thought. But on the field when that, that situation happened, I didn't I didn't cry. I didn't feel bad for not crying, but I I, I was sitting there I was like, what's going on? Like what's the and I, when I saw it happen, when he turned his head over and, and like he was gone for a couple of minutes, I'm like, oh, this is happening. And I just turned away and kind of just like waited it out in a way. I'm like, like is this gonna, is this, is this real? Like, is this happening? And everybody else is watching, and the people crying, and I'm looking around, and I'm just like, I really don't know what's, how to feel right now. And um, when like he kind of when he they brought him back and he was breathing and everything and I was like I was like I cheered inside I was like okay he's breathing I don't know you know how this goes but when the ambulance left I kind of had to trigger my brain back into we're about to play a game so that's where I was with the whole thing I was kind of in and out of it when it was going on but after he was breathing and everything and they took him away I was like all right it's time to play football. And I didn't want it. I didn't want it to be that way, but it's kind of like I don't know what's next, so I just gotta get ready. How can you even think about football at that point in time when you know your teammate and it's a brotherhood with a football yeah. team in that locker room, especially this team? I've been around the Packers, the Bills, you know, a bunch of teams, and it's just I've never seen a group this close. I think everybody here sees it. You know, those Fridays, you guys are doing the karaoke sessions, right, with Taiwan and Deanne Dawkins. And yeah. that, that's kind of the day-to-day -day life. You, you're around your teammates more than you're around your girlfriends, your wives, your brothers, your, anybody. I mean, it really is a family. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody could kind of see how much it was hitting everybody in that moment. I mean, just from up above, I mean, it was like you'd see some Bills players move toward mm -hmm. DeMar, see what was going on, and move away. You, they could, could, you couldn't even be around it to see... Like you said, it doesn't seem real when you're yeah. seeing CPR administered for yeah. nine minutes. For, yeah, it was it's a long time. Well, when it when it happened, I probably should say when it happened, I was watching and I saw him fall, and I thought somebody pushed him, but he didn't get up. So I'm thinking, okay, it's just a, probably a regular injury, got the wind knocked out of him or something. And I get closer, and he's bleeding, like out of his. I don't know where it's coming. Like I think it's out of his mouth or his Ble nose. Bleeding, you said? Yeah, he's bleeding, and. He was breathing, and then people started coming up, and, you know, the trainers and things around him. And as I'm watching, I'm like, he's breathing. Okay, everything's fine. And then his head turns to the side, and I'm like, and then somebody says, no pulse. And I'm like, what? And that's when I kind of, like, looked away and just didn't know how to feel at that point. I'm like, I was just in shock. Like, is this happening? And, yeah, so it kind of, like, went from there. And then after... Um, they brought us up, and they wanted us to, like, hey, play for our teammates. Da, da, da. And I didn't know what was going to happen, so I, like I said, I just triggered my brain to play football. And then um, they kind of can't not cancel, but postponed the game, and we went back in the locker room. And when we got back in the locker room, a lot of guys were crying, and a lot of guys were, didn't know what to do. And I just I was just sitting there just watching. I'm just looking at everybody like, I only know two things. We not playing. What we're playing. That's how I'm thinking about it. Like, and obviously think about Demar, but like sometimes at, at that point, I feel like there was nothing I can do at that point. 
I guess on the on the television broadcast, four different times, Joe Buck said that there was a five minute warm up period, um, yeah. and that you guys it was kind of like, all right, get back out there, fellas, time yeah. to play a football game. From your vantage point, was that was that the case? Did they, did somebody tell you, all right, five minutes to warm up? No. When, we, when McDermott walked back in the locker room, he was like, we're not playing. When you got to the locker room. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, like, on the on Oh, the field. on the field, yeah. It was on the field. Stephon Dig, uh, Diggs brought us up and was like, hey, let's get ready to play. Play for your brother. And he was just like, let's get ready to play. Basically doing what everybody, what we're naturally, you know, not naturally taught to do, but, like, what we've been molded to do. Like, hey, go on, next thing. You know, somebody gets hurt, next play. They get, like, that's just how it is. But in that situation, it was like, he was kind of like he was gone for a minute, and it was like, how do you wrap your brain around it? But it was kind of like how we're wired as football players. Like, let's just let's go. All right, it happened. Let's go. So when they brought us up, I was like, okay, we about to play. And then that's when the refs was like, hey, go to the locker room. And after that, McDermott caught, came in and said, hey, we're not playing unless you guys feel like you can play. And then that's when he left it up to the players. And then uh, Mitch was like, basically, like we're not playing. Mitch Morse, he spoke up. Yeah. In that moment, though, you said you heard uh, no pulse. Yeah. From a trainer, from from somebody that was right there. Yeah, they wanted the trainers. Yeah. So in that moment, you're thinking, Demar, my teammate, died on a football field. Yeah. Like, and at at that moment, I was like, he's gone. <laughs> but I was, I was like, I I didn't know how to take it and how to feel. Like I don't like, so I just walked away. And then I was in the back, and then I came back, and they were still, like, giving CPR and doing everything, and then he started breathing. And I was just, I was happy inside, but, like, I had no emotions on the outside. I was just watching. I think we, it, it's, it's not right, but I feel like everybody here, we've become so desensitized to that scene, right? Mm-hmm. Even... The stretcher, even an ambulance we've yeah. seen go out there. Dane Jackson yeah. earlier this season, which was a horrifying-looking injury. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, so hard to watch that. And this was a routine tackle, mm-hmm. something you see 200, 300 times on an NFL Sunday. Yeah. And we never got the thumbs up, you know, never got the wave. Like, mm-hmm. that, that moment that never came. Mm-hmm. And that, that's what made this so scary, I think, for, for everybody involved. I can't imagine being a player down there. So was it? Did you see Denny Kellington then, the assistant trainer? Yeah. Bring him back to life. Yeah. Well, yeah. Like I walked away. I came back. When I came back, and then, like they used the I don't know what you call the machine where they shock him. Defibrillator. Defibrillator. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, they used it, and then they, he, uh, then he was was he still doing his thing, and then next thing you know, he just started breathing, and he started taking deep breaths, and I was like, and like I said, I was excited, but I didn't like cheer or nothing. I was just like. Maybe smiled. I don't even know what I was doing at that moment, but I was like, my eyes got big, and I'm like, he, he's alive. And it's, yeah. So. How, how can you <laughs> even think about football, though? Like you said, there's a moment when you're, you're thinking you have to play this game, mm-hmm. and he's going off to the hospital. You still don't really know what's going to happen at UC Medical. Um, was, what, what was it like in that locker room? You said there were some, some tears, mm-hmm. a lot of emotions. When you guys went back into the locker room in Cincinnati, what did it look like? Um, everything was quiet. Everything was silent. People were crying, and you heard it. And then it was everybody was at their locker, and a little—I mean, everybody was just in shock. And then McDermott walked in and said what he said, and then everybody kind of like still quiet. They didn't know if they wanted to play or not. And then Josh brought us up, and he asked us like, yeah, "Do you want to play? If one guy can't play, then we're not playing." And then Mitch Moore spoke up and said, hey, we're not playing. So I was like, all right, we ain't playing. And he, I mean, Mitch is probably speaking for a lot of guys yeah. who don't want to speak up then, right? Exactly. And that, was, and that was kind of my thing. It was like there's a lot of guys in that locker room crying. There's a lot of guys that's like they don't know what to do. They don't know how to feel. And nobody's going to say anything because there's probably more people that wanted to play than there was people that didn't want to play. Is that right? Yeah. Like, because it's just how we wired. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and it's yeah. hard to say, but it's just like, I understood the situation. I understood what was going on. It was like, but I understood if we had to go back out there and play, we're gonna, I'm playing. If we don't, I'm not. But I was with either or. 
Maybe, maybe explain that hard wiring to everybody <laughs> here because I don't think any of us can relate to you, a professional football player. Like you, you guys are the modern day gladiators, you know, playing the most violent sport in the world, and, and it's part of what makes football such a great game. It's not for everybody. <laughs> it's just not. That's why we all watch. It entertains us. But you've got to be psychologically just wired different. I mean, if you're, I'm sure a lot of everybody here has been to a game. When you see it up close, yeah. and you've got 245 pound dudes with 8% body fat who bench <laughs> 225, 27 times and can run a 4 or 5, and they're hitting each other at all these weird angles. Doug Whaley was correct once upon a time when he said human beings were not meant to play football. He got a lot of flack for it. He was right. <laughs> What's that wiring? Like, how, how, how do you just, like, throw yourself into this world and, like, yep, a teammate of mine just died and was brought back to life, and we have to go finish this game? Well, I thought about it like this. Well, I'm pretty sure a lot of people thought about it like this. And, like, the military. You know, people die in the military more than football. So, I mean, we're not just like the military, but, like, to a certain extent, when it comes to, like, mentally, it's like we kind of relate, you know, and... You know, people down in the field of battle, you know, at war all the time. And the guy next to him just say, hey, we got to, he's gone. We got to keep going. And on a football field, you don't think about it like that. Like, oh, he's dead. We got to go. He's thinking, okay, he's hurt, Mm -hmm. but we still got to play. But in this situation, it is kind of tough because we have a teammate could possibly be gone. And. We've never we don't we don't see that often like we don't I've never seen it it, it crossed a threshold I yeah mean, this like, was different yeah this is way different and it's like but at the same time we under like once he started breathing um, in most people's minds it's treated like okay he's breathing now like we still have a job to do and it's 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 kind of like sad to say like we still have a job to do we do, you know. We can't put our, you can We can't put football on pause, because if we're gonna put a football on pause, then the whole NFL has to do it. Because obviously, because as you see now, everybody's, you know, showing love to Demar and things like that. So we can't be the only ones doing it, and nobody else doing it. So we understood like we got to go back out on the field, and we got to play until they tell us we we don't have to. You're right, because it, it always does kind of shock me. I mean, I remember, um, it might have been 2013, Jermichael Finley, he, he, he looked like he was paralyzed laying on the, on the field mm-hmm. when I was at Lambeau Field, and it's like he gets taken off on a stretcher, everybody just continues to play. And that happens all the, this year especially. I feel like it's been happening a lot, but this definitely crossed a different threshold. Mm-hmm. And I thought Tredavious White, you know, he, he was really emotional yesterday. Did you catch his press conference? And, yeah, I saw it this morning. Yeah. I thought he put it really well in saying, like, whether it's him, you. I mean, you grew up in South Florida. You, you saw some stuff. Mm. We've talked about it on this show, right? I mean, you were grazed by a bullet. That bullet could have gone a different direction, and we're not sitting here talking. I mean, you saw a body on your doorstep, and Taiwan Jones, I've talked to him about this stuff. A lot of you guys have seen a lot of stuff in your, where you grew up, but Tredavia said this was just different because it's like you're seeing it start to finish. Like, you're mm. seeing the hit. And he falls down. He gets back up. He collapses. The CPR, to see the CPR, mm. administer. I never seen that in my life till that night. And then he dies. He comes back to life. Yeah. It, did, did this feel different than everything you saw growing up down in Miami? Um, because you've seen a lot. I don't. In a way, I just took it. I don't even know. Like I said, I don't. I didn't know how to feel. Like I was like hoping. You know he was okay, but at the same time, like I, I didn't know. Like I said, it was it was nothing I could do. Like yeah, I wasn't yeah. given the CPR. Just kind of like a helpless like, helplessness. I was yeah. It was it was nothing I could do, and I, I knew my tears wouldn't help. So like, and I, I I wouldn't I wasn't gonna cry if I couldn't, and I wasn't gonna force myself to cry. I wasn't gonna force myself to do something. Like I don't know. So I just didn't know how to feel. It, I couldn't do much. You know what I'm saying? I didn't. Post on Instagram. I didn't yeah. talk about it on Twitter. Like, well, tell us about Demar. I mean, your your relationship with him. Um, we've learned a lot about him. I I got to know him really well over Wings up in Elmo's a year and a half ago for a story. He's just like he's kind. Mm. He's got a gentle soul. I mean, he's been through so much in his life back in McKees Rocks and 
I mean, he said he's lost more than half of his friends before they even turned 21. It's, his life's unbelievable. And he, he, he's always wanted to inspire kids back in McKees Rocks, and lo and behold, he raised, what, $9, $10 million, which is unbelievable. Um, what, what's DeMar really like as a teammate? Well, he's, he's, he's awesome. Um, he's worked his way up, you know, to a starter in this league, and, you know, Micah got hurt, and then he came right in. He filled the role, and um, he's, been, he's a great football player. And then off the field, in the locker room, you know, I don't – I wouldn't say I don't talk to him much, but it's, it's kind of different than, you know, when the guys are in this room, like Micah Hyde and all those guys. They talk to him more than I do. Yeah. And, you know, me, I'm cracking jokes. So <laughs> me and him, we probably crack jokes to each other, compete against each other on the field. But he's never rubbed me the wrong way. You know, he's always been nice. I'm saying, you know, we say hi, bye, we talk, we have a little conversations, play around and things like that. But um, I feel like, you know, I – now probably should get to know him more, you know, and, you know, just seeing what he went through and things like that. But for the most part, he's never rubbed me the wrong way, and, you know, he's always been good to me. When did the, the good news start rolling into you guys then? So he gets to the hospital. Um, you guys head back to Buffalo. You're not really sure where this is going to go. Mm-hmm. You're optimistic a little bit maybe, but you, don't really, you really don't know. Uh, when did guys start hearing, okay, this thing, he's, he's improving here exponentially. Uh, I want to say it to be probably at the beginning of the week. They was just trying to tell us, like, they said he was, um, what did I say? Oh, they were saying he was using 50% of the oxygen. He was yeah. breathing, eventually breathing on his own. And then um, they rolled him over on his stomach so the blood can come out. I mean, so they can drain his lungs. And then they finally rolled him back on his back. And they told us that earlier in the week. And then um, eventually... Um, they got us on FaceTime with him. Man, what was that like? To, <laughs> that was, to see Damar? <laughs> that was cool because McDermott told us, he was like, yeah, he might not be able to talk because he had the two. And he's, um, he got on FaceTime and he was like, I love you. all And he was like, I thought he couldn't talk. <laughs> but um, he talked and then everybody was cheering. And it was cool. It was a sight to see. And then it was awesome. So. I mean, it really seemed like your ability as a team to, to, to think about football, let alone play a game, it was directly tied to every, like, every bit of information you got out of that hospital room and the intensive care unit, right? Like, mm-hmm. you, you needed that good news yeah. to even move on. You don't even think about the hypothetical. If it went the other direction, I mean, there's no, there's no game. There, there might not be a season. Yeah. Um, what, what was it like to really be on edge and get these – Little updates that okay, he's the oxygen level's getting better. He's mm-hmm. he's you know neurologically he's there. Yeah. Um. Could you kind of feel yourself being able to think about football and get back to that mode? Well, are you talking about for me? For me? Yeah. F- for me, I kind of I like I said I didn't know where to go with it because in my mind I'm like okay I'm being optimistic I'm like okay he's he's gonna be fine he's breathing everything's gonna be fine. You know, and then it was like, oh, it could be like he didn't get if he doesn't get enough oxygen to his brain, then right. He, that that he was kind of like the big thing that everybody was thinking, but nobody's really yeah. talking about because there's a period of time when he wasn't able to breathe. You don't know what happened to the yeah, body. You don't know, you know, what could happen to the body. And then yeah. that's when I was like, okay, well, you know, what I'm if if he makes it and everything's fine and he comes back 100, percent then awesome. If something's wrong and things like that, when you know then he'll have, we'll have to work through it. But in, like I never, for me, it was kind of, I just thought positive about it. He's going to be fine. He's breathing. Yeah, he has yeah. a chance. And the football part, it was like, okay, I know I can transition my brain to football whenever we're ready. So I was just waiting on everybody else. What, what's it like as a player to see everybody in this room at Misters, this place is packed, <laughs> And beyond, throughout the country, throughout the world, everybody pulling for Demar Hamlin. I mean, I've never seen anything in sports or otherwise unify humanity like that. Like everybody's quick to argue about something nonstop. Sports, politics, whatever. Like we just we're at each other's at each other's throats twenty four seven. Social media doesn't help, but this like brought everybody together in a mm-hmm. way I've never seen in my life. I mean, have you ever seen anything like this? And no, what was it like? This is my first time. Um, it was awesome. Everybody showed support and everybody understood that, you know, we're just human. You know what I'm saying? We play this gladiator sport, but we're, at the same time, we're still human. And this happened, this could happen to anyone, but it happened to, you know, one of our guys that plays in the NFL. And 
he's not only a football player, but he's a son. You know what I'm saying? He's, you know, one day will be a father and, you know, he needs his life just like any other human does. And uh, I think under, everybody understood that from, you know, you know, all parts of the world, every sport understood, like, you know, he's still human and he needs his life. So let's support him. And I understood that too. So fast forward, you're getting all the good news. Mm. You're going to play a football game. And I think he broke the team down, right, inside the yeah, locker room? Yeah, after the game, yeah. Okay, was it before the game and after the game? It was after the game. After the game, yeah. okay. So what, what's the scene really like when you're able to interact with DeMar Hamlin after this game? we got to talk about the game, too, obviously. But. <laughs> um, no, he, he just broke it down. He didn't say too much. He was just, we were just cheering for him when we saw him on FaceTime. Yeah. And then he broke it down, and then we just broke it down. But it was pretty cool. Man, and the game itself. It's, it's weird to transition into to football. I mean, there was a point there. It's like, a, can we, how, how do you re- reconcile watching, supporting this game that just did that to a human being? But he rallied everybody and unified everybody in a way, and the good news kept coming in that I mean, the emotions were going to go one way or another in this game from the yeah. opening kickoff. Um, was anybody at the game, by the way? Who was at the, was it just, just wild, that opening kickoff? Yeah, it was crazy. <laughs> how loud how loud really was it you've been here for a while now isaiah how, where does that register on the richter scale for you well i mean <laughs> i mean it's all i feel like it's always loud so yeah. it, but when that happened it was actually i was standing by the heater and me and gabe were standing right here and um he said uh uh get ready to go out and i'm like ah okay i was like we're probably not gonna go out and i was just just bsing you know <laughs> just talking I said, like, yeah, probably not go out. And next thing you know, he scores, and I'm like, oh, we ain't going for real. <laughs> we, we not going for real. And he was like, yeah, I was thinking the same thing. But I was like, he was like, I didn't want to say it. I was like, and then we um, went to the sideline, and then Josh was, um, got emotional and things like that. But um, it was a pretty cool sight. He called it spiritual, right? Yeah. Three exactly. years and three months since the last I, I had game. no idea. I had no idea with that, the three years and three months thing. But. Did you feel goosebumps yourself? Did it no. feel spiritual at all? No. No, I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're honest. No, I, didn't, I, I just saw it as another kick return, but I mean, I understood like everything that was going on around me, but I just looked at it as, oh, he ran a kick return back. And then he ran a yeah. second one back. Yeah. And I was like, ooh, he, he's on fire. <laughs> so what is the mentality of the team like right now? Because I, I don't like listening to Tredavious White and, and some of you guys speak after the game. It feels like PTSD. I mean, it's not like he, everybody's just celebratory and you can just kind of put that in the back of your brains and fight for a Super Bowl. Maybe you can, but this, <laughs> something like that kind of sticks with guys. Um, what, 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 how would you describe just the, the, the psyche of the Buffalo Bills at this point as the playoffs are now right around the corner? Um, I just think we play for him. You know, we play for yeah. DeMar. He can't play. We understand that, and, you know, we understand what happened to him, and we just got to play for him, and everybody's going to, you know, say we have to play for him. But at the same time, we also we understand we got to play for us as well. We, have, we still have a job to do. So I think it, it, at this point, we under, he's okay. Yeah. He's breathing. He's alive. He's, he's back, right? He's back. <laughs> so it's amazing. It's, it's kind of, it's, you know, we don't want to just not think about him, but at the same time, we – we got to go out here and win. I mean, we saw like Rex Ryan in, in tears saying, like, we needed to hear him say, did we win? As, yeah. I mean, he, he kind of shed tears for everybody. Like, everybody needed to know he was okay. Mm-hmm. Now that he's, he's coming back. Yeah. <laughs> is everybody okay? Maybe it's like, hey, you I, can really I, rally around this. I feel like everybody's okay. Yeah. You know, everybody's fine. And he got discharged today. Right. So everybody's going to feel even better when they see him and, you know, get to hug him and things like that and come around him and he's around the team and stuff. So, you know, as long as he get, he's walking and talking and he's alive, we're fine. It's, it's unbelievable. I mean, in a span of one week, <laughs> how, how far he's come with that <laughs> yeah. cardiac arrest. Uh, the game itself, there was a game, I suppose. <laughs> it was pretty important. Yeah, yeah the New England Patriots in the stadium, uh, some ups and downs, but... Uh, where, where do you think this offense is right now? We've, you've kind of been following it throughout the course of the season. Um, yes. <laughs> Probably a couple of things we need to work on, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. Going into the playoffs, we can't do what we did yesterday. I know that. Um, mm-hmm. But 
you know, it's the playoffs. Either one and done. You got to find a way to win or find a way to go home if you lose. <laughs> but you, you personally, just before I forget too, because I think earlier this year, I mean, you had the concussion, mm. right? That, that was a vicious hit. Um, I mean, you said how you were just out cold yeah. on the field. And then was it a couple episodes ago, you, you said, yeah, if you win the Super Bowl, you're going to retire. Mm. I mean, you're probably thinking about injuries and violence in football and how much do I really want to put myself in the harm's way? You're a little guy. <laughs> Not a lot of Isaiah sitting here. Does this um, affect you at all in terms of your willingness to play such a violent game when you see what you saw Monday night? Uh, no. Really? <laughs> no. Not at all? Um, no. I just, I mean, even though I got hurt early in the season, I got a concussion and things like that, it didn't, it tore my mind. It's like, hey, I'm, I'm going to stop. I mean, and the reason why I said I would retire after the Super Bowl because that was, all, that was always, I always said that. Like, if we win the Super Bowl, I'm retired. Yeah. You know I'm saying? Not related to, like, injuries, injuries or anything, no. Yeah. But, you know, seeing that last week and understand what could happen to possibly happen to, you know, anyone, um, like you said, I'm small. But um, I don't. I don't think it's deterring me from doing what I have to do. This is how I make my money. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And if I gotta, you know, if if it happened to me, it's like, hey, I left it all out there, you know. That's too. Is what's true too is I think how we can all kind of reconcile watching the sport. It's like, yeah, they, you guys are entertaining a lot of people, mm-hmm. but also, I mean, you all come from. You know, different pockets of the country, and you're inspiring. Like Demar, I mean, he's inspiring so many kids on his, in his neighborhood, on his street in McKees Rocks, right? Like, that that's so valuable, and this 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 game really does provide a platform for all of you to. Maybe maybe there's a kid watching somewhere that you know, is in a bad place, could go down the wrong path, mm-hmm. but they say, "Oh, that Isaiah, he was he lived on my street." You know, mm-hmm. he's my dad him or something. I'm, I, there is something else out there. Yeah, I mean, there is a lot of good that this sport can still give, isn't there? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because it's going to be, I mean, after something like this, sport's going to be under attack, right? Oh, of course. I think we're all thinking, do we want our kids to play? True. Well, that's, that, was the, that was the thought before, you know, that, that happened. You know, I feel like a lot of people say, I don't want my kids to play football. But for the, you know, I mean, not all kids have to play football. I feel like I had to play football because, I mean, it's, it's a way to make money. And, like, my kids don't have to play football. That's why I'm doing it now. You know what I'm saying? If they want to do something else, then okay. But, you know, for somebody had to do it. Yeah. You know, if this, I mean, I'm, I couldn't become an astronaut. So, like, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, you, I had to, I had to do something. Is, you said you want to be, just have a briefcase up in an office somewhere, right? <laughs> yeah, I couldn't, be, I couldn't become an accountant. So, I was like, okay, I'm playing football and I make this, I make this good money, but I'm making this good money not for me, but for my future wife. You know, so some, you know. Uh, Future hey, wife? Uh, Anything you want to do, Isaiah? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Got a decent crowd, so. <laughs> but you know, and the, <laughs> the kids we want to have, like, yeah. I and I understand if we have boys, they're probably gonna look at to me and say, "Hey, I want to play football." But I'm making this money and I'm doing this, so when it's you know at the end of the day, they say, "Okay, I don't just have to play football." You know, yeah. my dad did what he did, so we don't have to play football. But I had to do it first because nobody did it before me. I mean, I'm conflicted, too. I mean, I feel like this sport gives you qualities as a human being like other sports can't, too, yeah. because of that violence, right? Like, accountability. Like, if I don't do my job, I might get the guy next to me creamed. You know, there's a pressure. You're under the lights. There's, there's, there's a lot of things that go into it. But, man, you're getting the hell beat out of you, too. Like, there's just... <laughs> yeah. they, that's trees. what comes with it. You, know what yeah. you signed up yeah. for it. Like we talked about last time. You sign up for this job, there's things that can come with this job that you don't want. It's getting hit and getting cut and not making a lot of the money you want to make. You know, women. You know, you know. well, women, I'm pretty sure a lot of people want, but <laughs> other things, you know, the bad side of it. But there's also a lot of good side to it. But you just got to, you know, keep your head on the right track and everything good that you want out of it can come out of it. Maybe we need Demar sitting here for this one, but do, do you think that we'll see Demar Hamlin on a football field? Not this year, no. Again, I mean, again, <laughs> no. I have no idea. That's yeah. hard to say. I'm pretty sure he he wants he want to play. You know, if everything goes well, you know, at the end, of, you know, when he's 
hundred percent healthy, one hundred and ten percent healthy. I'm pretty sure you want to get back out there, but for right now, no. He's an incredible human being. I mean, yeah. it's, it's it is great to see everybody just kind of rally around him like that and to raise all that money. Um, unbelievable. So when it comes to the team, playoffs around the corner. Yeah, they're right here. You sound a little a little concerned about the offense, but <laughs> how do you get it back on track then? Like, what, um, what needs to be tweaked? It just go back to the details and refocus because now it's like, hey, you lose this one, you're out, you're going home. And then I haven't – we had this talk earlier today. I haven't necessarily packed to go home yet. So that means we got to keep winning. <laughs> uh, so um, I really – but I want to win. And now we're in the playoffs. The regular season's over. And we just got to put our best foot forward and try to win the, try to do everything the right way. Even though we know everything's not going to go right, but try to play a perfect game, try to play sound football and just do what we do. I mean, it is insane what you guys have been through this year. Yeah, I said the same thing. <laughs> I mean, back to Dawson Knox's brother. <laughs> yeah. Kim Pagula, her undisclosed health issues. You've got the two blizzards. Yeah. Micah the Hyde. second of which, Micah Hyde. John Poirier, the world war warrior. And oh, by the way, a, a mass shooting at a downtown <laughs> yep. tops. It's just, I, I don't, I don't. John Murphy has a stroke. I mean, un- unbelievable guy John is. I, I can't. I don't know how much more the Buffalo Bills and the city of Buffalo can take. <laughs> but the resiliency of the city and the team, and they're really one and the same here. It's unbelievable, isn't it? To, to, to live it, to see it up close. Uh, we talked about. I, I talked about it with a couple of my teammates during the week. I'm like, there has to be something that good coming out of this all this bad you know like i mean i don't know if it's a super bowl because like that's our goal and that's what we have kind of that's what gotta we, be a super bowl right <laughs> that's the only outcome for the bills um but who knows you know but we just gotta keep fighting you know and i feel like for the most part i no team has gone through what we've gone through so you know it, if we don't win a super bowl you know as individuals we learned a lot from these, you know, these situations we've been through. But um, as a team, you know, we can just grow and get better each and every year, each and every day. And, you know, I'm pretty sure something good comes out of this. I don't know what, but I, was, I, I hope so. Like you said earlier, I mean, the only reaction you can really have is being positive, yeah. being optimistic. As this stuff keeps happening, you, you have to be positive mm. because that, that stuff is contagious. Yeah. I mean, Ta- Taiwan said the same thing. Like, you... When you enter the building, you got to be a plus, not a minus, because then the person you're interacting with is going to feed off of that energy. Yeah. It's kind of like all of us in our everyday lives. Yeah. It, it, that, that stuff is contagious. It can, be the, it can go the other way. Yeah. Right? Even if you're down and you're out. Earlier in the week, it was, and I'm a guy that comes in and I'm telling jokes, smiling, and even when I walked in the building, I'm like, should I even smile today? You know, during, early in the week, and it's like, should I even tell a joke I don't want to tell the wrong joke. Or, or, you know, it's just like, but then I walked in the building and I was like, whatever, I'm going to tell a joke anyway. <laughs> and I'm going to go and I'm going to go in there. I'm going to play cornhole. I'm going to do, I'm going to just be normal, you know, because if everybody's walking, moping and crying and grieving and I understand why, but everybody can't do it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do it. So I was just went in there and just, you know, tried to be positive the best way I can, crack a few jokes, smiled here and there. But, um, did you break the ice then? Like, Probably. You, was there a joke that kind of loosened everybody up um, in there? Probably to individuals. Yeah. But to the whole team, I didn't crack it. I was probably walking around. I mean, even sitting here, usually we're like laughing and telling <laughs> jokes and having fun. And it's just been, like really serious. But it has to be. Like it's hard to – you can't just all of a sudden be having fun and joke. Yeah. But, but it's got to get back to normalcy at some point. Yeah. And that's how I felt. Like it, at some point, we got to get back to normal. Because if, it's, if we're down, and then we have to go play football, because that's the at the end at the end of the day, like that's why we're all here, you know, as players. Like we're here to play a game, and we understand our mental and everything. But at the end of the day, we still have to go out there and play football. So, <laughs> well, yeah. the way you do it is by guaranteeing a win right here on the Isaiah McKenzie show. That's <laughs> Miami. You know, create a stir. <laughs> Miami Dolphins. We don't know what's going to happen with Tua. Oh, we'll see. I don't think he should play either, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, he's had several concussions. Yeah. Um, we'll see what happens there. They, I mean, I'll say it. They probably don't really have much of a shot without him. But with him, 
I mean, they were up on you guys by eight in the fourth quarter. Got so, a chance. Got a chance. Yeah, it's a lot of health issues down there in Miami. Yeah, with him, you hope that uh, his long-term health is taken into consideration. Mm-hmm. All right, let's loosen it up. Let's open up some some questions here. I'm sure there's a lot, and we want to try to get to as many people as we can. So, and we got yeah, we and we got 30 minutes. So I need 30 yeah. minutes worth of questions. That's right. Not five minutes, 30 <laughs> minutes worth of questions. Everything is on the table. Football, test, life. Test. Just raise your hand. We'll kind of work the room. Don't be scared. Don't be afraid. Sweet. What? I'm good. Sweet. All right, Isaiah, um, I wanted to ask you about Coach McDermott and oh. how he's been able to more or less keep this team afloat and through the mass shooting and the Kim Bakula's house, house scare and losing your two defensive stars in Micah Hyde and Von Miller and then the snowstorm that, kept, that made you guys go to Detroit and lose a home game to the snowstorm or the blizzard that killed 40 people here and then to Mar Hamlin's uh, situation. Um, how has he been able to keep this team like afloat? And I wanted to ask this because I recently found out that you, you know you were the you're one of like the longest tenured players on the team. You know, I remember hearing about you in Josh Allen's rookie year, and you scored a touchdown against Jacksonville, and I'm like, who the hell is Isaiah McKenzie? <laughs> when did we get this guy? But yeah, can you comment about uh, Coach McDermott and how he's been able to coach the year? In my opinion keep this team uh, afloat and potentially in the running for, you know, a Super Bowl right now? Because it's crazy the amount of adversity you guys have overcome. Uh, I would say he's, he's done a great job. And over the years, Coach McDermott has grown as a coach. And like you said, I've been here, well, yeah, the longest tenure player to be here, well, besides Mike and him. But I've been here and I've been, me and him have had, you know, conversations over the years and Every year, I feel like this year, he's, like, taking a huge step as a coach. And he was already a great coach, but, like, now it's – he's, like, over the top. And I feel like with all that going on, he still – he stayed level-headed. He didn't get too high. He didn't get too low. He just stayed the course. And, you know, after this, you know, what happened to DeMar, that kind of showed what kind of coach he really was. When we went in the locker room and he said, we're not playing – and he left it in the player, the, the player's hands, and it was like, okay, well, you know, he kind of like left it up to us, and he's, but he, in his mind, he was like, we're not playing, but if it, if you guys want to play, we'll play. But he didn't really want, he didn't really want to play, but he understood the guys. And at the end of the day, it's up to the team. And I feel like for him, this whole season, he's has he's been le- leaving it up to the players, like, hey. You guys run this team. You know, I'm the coach of this team, but I can't play for you guys. You know, I can't be in the, in the locker room. I can't go home with you guys. So I need you guys to help me and figure any, any things out. You know, even with the snowstorm, you know what I'm saying? He was, he, he told us, what we, you know, what we could do. And he, we came with opinions, and, you know, with our, and he listened to us. So I feel like for the most part, for a great coach, and he's becoming like a tremendous coach. He's he's listening to his guys and listening to his players. And like I said, in that Demar situation, as a as a just a man and as a coach, as as a guy that has a family, he understood what needs to be done. And we wasn't gonna play that football game. And he understood that. And he said, We come before the NFL. And that's where he kinda like got everybody's respect. Not saying he didn't have everybody's respect, but everybody really was like, You handled that well. And like I said, the whole season he's been level-headed, and you know we're up to this point. If he doesn't win Coach of the Year, I then mean, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what coach has been through, what he's been through. So you know, like if this is not what Coach of the Year looks like, then I don't know what it is. Because you know, I, well, yeah. well said. I mean, how has he really grown? Over the course of, of maybe maybe it is just this year because I've heard him described as you know robotic, militaristic yeah. even, <laughs> which I get because life under Rex was a little do whatever the hell you want, guys. Yeah. 
a little crazy. <laughs> um, so you kind of have, I mean, you see this all the time in the NFL. You have that kind of coach, and it swings back to somebody else. So may- maybe that was needed, but over time, I mean, you got to you gotta let, God, you gotta let your players be, be themselves. Yeah. Um, so and what I, does that look like up close? Um, for him, I feel like for the, for, the most, for the first part, he brought the right guys in. You know what I'm saying? With right. Josh. Then he, uh, I came along, you know what I'm saying? Not saying, <laughs> to be honest, when I came along, Bean brought me in. And then me and McDermott got to know each other over the years. You know, so, but, you know. So it Josh, was a, a relationship that evolved over time. Over time, yeah. <laughs> so, um, and then, like, he brought guys like Bees, John Brown in. You know, just speaking from a receiver standpoint, Micah and Jay, Jay and Poirier. And our, the, the defense was kind of already close, and the guys, they've grown together. The offense was kind of trying to figure it out. And we've kind of grown together, you know, growing with Josh, things like that. But when you have a whole team that's grown together on each side of the ball, and you can kind of, like, give it to the players at that point. Okay, I got a good group of guys around, you know, around each other. So now I can make this a, this a, player's te- a player team. Because some coaches have to take over because, you know, the locker room's not right. On the field, you can see it's not going well. But for us, the locker rooms, we get along. We have a great group of guys around each other. And on the field, it shows. You know, we play together. We play for each other. So for McDermott, all you got to do is not mess that up, not have teammates going against each other, not, you know, separating guys. Just let us be as one. Let us play together and hear us out as a team instead of individu- as individuals. And I feel like he's done that over the years. You know, he's just hearing us out. He's asking for guys' opinions. You know, he's letting the leaders of the team, you know, take this team on and, you know, it, it shows. You know, and if he has to override something, in a way he doesn't just say, it's my way or the highway. It's kind of, okay, it's my way, but I want you guys' opinion about it. Right. You know, so I feel like that. This was like the ultimate – Example of that. Yes. You know. Do you even want to play this game? Yeah. Put it put it in your hands. In his mind it was like, We're not playing. I don't really want to play this game, but I'm gonna leave it up to y'all because at the end of the day it's you guys' team. I'm just a coach. You know, but in his mind it's like I, I don't want to play this game. I don't want you guys to play this game, you know, what happened and I'm looking at you guys and I don't think you guys should play. But if you say otherwise, let me know. Well said. So all said. Question here. Oh. <laughs> Yesterday, Chris Sims said he felt that football overtook baseball as America's favorite sport. Uh-huh. And t- do you agree? Uh, to me, I always thought football was America's favorite sport. Am I wrong? Well, I, th- I always thought because I played a sport, I thought because. Like football brings everybody together. Like, like who's like you don't even know when a baseball game is played. Like I turn on the TV sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I turn on the TV sometimes. And I'm like, oh, baseball's on. <laughs> but you know, every then, Sunday, then you took a nap, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, every Sunday, you're like football coming on at one o'clock, four thirty, and eight yeah. twenty. Thursday, Monday, and Sunday. Sometimes Saturday. Like, baseball is on, like, randomly. And, like, not every – you don't even see this, like, baseball, the stand's not even packed unless it's the playoffs and the World Series. The people are reading books in the crowd. Yeah, like, eating hot dogs. Knitting. Yeah, like, it's just – I feel like it's social gathering. And football is not – it's like, I'm locked in. Like, everybody in the stadium is locked in. Like, you know, in baseball, you're not hearing 65,000 people screaming because of home run. You hear, like, 5,000. And then the other people are like, oh, that was cool. <laughs> Back to the crossword puzzle. Back to, yeah. <laughs> so I always felt like football was America's sport because every Sunday, Monday, Thursday, it's like everybody's watching that and nothing else. But that's, I mean, it is ridiculous you guys play football on Thursday nights, right? If the league wants to talk about players' safety, <laughs> not, all this mumbo-jumbo, oh, let's add another game. Oh, let's play on Thursday night. Let's, let's have these preseason games and make season ticket holders pay full price to watch third stringers batch. <laughs> like, don't sell us that the game is safe and you're making it safer when you're doing that BS. <laughs> but I just... You agree, right? now? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is what it is, but I mean, at the end of the day, it's still America's game. I feel like it's America's game, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah, it is. I mean, no, they'd have football every day of the week if they could. 
Then that would, I mean, then then we'll turn to baseball probably. Yeah. If you have it every day of the week, you turn to baseball. Nobody's watching. Like, think about it. When the season's over, like, you have nobody has nothing to do. Like, you it's not, literally like no football. You like there's nothing to do for people that love football. For baseball, like they're like oh, I'll catch the game tomorrow. Right. There's another, oh, the Rockies play them all. We can watch them tomorrow. It's not hyper. People structure their entire <laughs> lives around, around football. football. Like, people get divorced. Right. Because of this. Yeah. Like, you know how people get divorced because of baseball? <laughs> <laughs> so. He has a real question. He said, so. It's a real question. <laughs> He's going to grill you. So, um, I just have a real quick question. So, on, how does it feel to be in the NFL? Mm. Uh, it's fun. Uh, it's, it's fun. I can't lie. It is fun. Um, I would say, to go in details, you have to be on a good team for it to be fun. And I feel like I've been on a good team for a couple of years. That It's been awesome. You know, other teams are not like our team. So if you grow up and you make it to the NFL, just know that I said every team is not like the Buffalo Bills. Um, you can go to other organizations, and it's a complete, you know, sh- poop show. <laughs> and and it can get bad. You know, you, you like, I go into work every day, and I'm like, like, I don't have to worry about anything. I'm I'm happy. I can do my job well. Like, I'm not worried about getting cut. You know what I'm saying? I'm not worried about fighting people in the locker room. I'm not worried about cursing out coaches. I'm, I'm, I go into work, and I'm like, I'm glad I'm here. You know what I'm saying? Because I've been on the other side where I go to work, and I'm like, sure. I'm next. <laughs> they might cut me next. And damn sure I got cut. I was like, <laughs> yeah. Denver. <laughs> right in Denver. But, you know, not every, not every place is like, the Buff- I mean, this organization, the Buffalo Bills. So the NFL is fun when you're winning. When you're losing, it sucks. <laughs> so remember that. <laughs> winning cures all. Excuse me, sorry. Who's your best friend on the team? <laughs> Great question. I get this. <laughs> um... <laughs> Ooh. Well, I had. Well, I wouldn't say I had, but the the two guys I was that I'm close to on the team is Gabe Davis and Isaiah Hodges. Well, Isaiah Hodges plays for the Giants now, but I still talk to him. But those are two guys I hung out with the most, and um, I would say that I consider them, you know, good friends. Uh, I I want. I'm pretty sure everybody thinks like Josh, but no. <laughs> no. Me and him got a, like a love hate relationship like some days I hate him some days he hate me sometimes I like him so it's <laughs> where's like, it at right now I mean the playoffs or this weekend is it, is it love or is it hate well right now we won't know until tomorrow well it's Wednesday <laughs> <laughs> just let them know you're open yeah yeah you gotta keep letting them know that you know I, I get I stopped saying that a long time ago so it's like <laughs> hopefully he sees me somewhere The Georgia dog, the Bulldogs are playing, by the way. So, um, ah. who who do you think is gonna win the national championship and why? Georgia. <laughs> it's not even a question. Oh, that's right. Your Georgia Bulldogs are playing. <laughs> I mean, I went. So I don't think he knows. I went to Georgia, and uh, TCU. I, I don't think TCU has a chance. So I'm I'm going with Georgia because that's the home team for me. <laughs> and they won it last year. Why not win it again, right? Yeah, they can pay players now, too, so they're probably <laughs> paying them a lot. Too bad you missed that. I want to be like you, and will you throw my football to me? You will you throw a football what was the to second him? thing? Um, oh, yeah, I'll sign this football for you. <laughs> <laughs> I think... Absolutely. Oh, yeah, we should... Isaiah will be... Uh, you'll be hanging yeah, out for a bit I'll afterwards, too, out. right? forgot to mention that. I'm going to make an assumption here that yeah. we're going to squish the fish this weekend, uh-huh. and that's going to lead the Bills to the Bengals 
the Chiefs, NFC champs in the Super Bowl. The, the, like, this is it, the hardest part of the whole season. Let's, let's not think about tomorrow. Are, how do you guys prepare for that? Like, a gladiator sport, all this, and this is like the four weeks to define it all, the hardest teams in the NFL. You guys talking about that? You already preparing? Uh... Because I think, you know, <laughs> football feels kind of trivial after something like that happens, right? Like, like, who cares about preparing for a game when you see what you saw? But you have to, right? But the, yeah. this gauntlet of games coming up. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, we understand, you know, what's in front of us. I, I don't think we're – yeah, I think we – I mean, I don't know, like – Take it week by week? Yeah, I, I don't think we're going to look ahead to the Bengals and Ravens. I think we're going to look at the Dolphins first. It's our third time playing them, so take it week by week and say, okay, well, we got to win this game, then we got to win the next, and then we got to win the next. Because we look too far, and then we lose, and then like, okay, so, okay, we're packing, going home. And then everything we did was a waste. So I feel like it's one week at a time. So we can start at the Dolphins. Okay. <laughs> If you didn't play for the Buffalo Bills, what team would you play for? Um, probably the Dolphins. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, my favorite part of that question is that's come up a few times, and it's Dolphins every time. Dolphins the reaction is that every time, and you stay strong. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a dog? Do I have a daughter? Yeah. No, I'm trying to. No, make... a dog. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, I have a dog. It's a pit bull. Yeah. Against all odds, um, and we save pit bulls. So, oh. Yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah, I have I have one. Yeah. And, um, yeah, he's okay. pretty crazy. I heard something about that. I just wanted to see if you did. Yeah. That's I awesome. Have. He's he's doing he's doing well. I I'm seeing him tonight, so yeah. No children though to your knowledge. Oh no, I thought she asked about it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean I guess that's how you make them, right? So, yeah. <laughs> how did you get into the NFL? Um when I was born, they was like, I'm going to the NFL. So I was just like, no I'm kidding. Um, um it started when I was nine years old. And I just kind of like every day went to practice, made some plays, and just hopefully, you know, just hoping I got looked at for high school and then college and then NFL. It's, it's, it's a long journey, but you, if you stay the course, it's possible. It's not 100% guaranteed, but it's possible. But you just kind of, for me, it was like I just worked and let everything happen the way it happened. But you kind of, because to be honest, it is kind of rough. Like every day waking up like, oh, man, I'm only nine years old. Like how am I going to get to the NFL? And then you turn 14 and you're only 14 years old. And it's like you got to wait till you're 20, 21 to get to the NFL. And you got your whole high school career focuses on college and then your whole college career focusing on NFL and next thing you know you're 21 and you're like dang I didn't even get to have fun as a kid <laughs> <laughs> I, I was too busy getting hit by me, you know, men that are bigger than me or boys that are bigger than me and it's like but when you're 21 and you're in the NFL it's like it was worth it because now I'm 27 I'm old no offense right? <laughs> I'm 27 and I'm old and it's like well I'm 27, but I got a lot of money. So it's just like, <laughs> but it's worth it. Like, you know, like I was saying earlier, to help out my kids eventually that I will have and, you know, my girlfriend, <laughs> it's worth it. So when you, when you think about it, think about it, it's worth it. When I get to, when you get 21 years old, you'll be like, and hey, you make it to the NFL, you're like, it was worth it. Isaiah said it was worth it. <laughs> so. You're right. Well oh. said. 
Who did you look up to in football when you were growing up? Who was your favorite player? Who was your like idol? Um, uh, I had a couple, I think. You know, just looking at guys and like, oh, he's fast, and I want to be as fast as him. Like Devin Hester's, Steve Smith. Um, I don't know if you know who these guys are, but oh, okay, my bad. Sorry, I didn't say women don't know football. I did not say that. <laughs> no, but um, um. Yeah, it was a couple of guys I looked up to um, as I saw growing up. And like Marcus Vick, Michael Vick, you know, just guys that the are rare. Dying. Marcus Vick reference. People forget Yeah, because my favorite brother. college was Virginia Tech. Yeah. And that was because of him. And um, I feel like there was a, guy, a bunch of guys that very, you know, good at what they do. And I just looked up to a lot of guys. And I wasn't as big as them, so I was like, well, I probably can't do that, but yeah. I could do that. You know, so, yeah. It was a couple guys. I just mentioned a couple. All right. Let's talk weather. So you grew up where it was warm. Yeah. And now you're up here in the cold. So on a scale of 9 to 10, how much do you hate the cold? 10. And <laughs> how much does it really affect a team like Miami coming up next weekend? To be honest, now that <laughs> – um, I don't think it affects them at all. Because they they came up here and they was running the ball, they was throwing the ball, they was having fun. And I'm like, and then I'm like, this is not affecting them at all. I think everybody thought they just would disintegrate. Yeah, right. Well, you to thought a, that too. You thought that too, by the way. Don't. I, I didn't think that. You, you thought it was I like two. I think two was good. No, no. You said. I remember. You said, just put a pile of snow on their yeah. sideline. Yeah, I said, well, they do the thing where the heat. your face in the sun. Yeah. I'm saying you guys should have taken advantage of the snow somehow. Like, yeah, just plow all the snow over to their sideline, make it miserable somehow. You know, lean into your weather. That's it's a home field advantage. Do well, something. I guess, but it's still, like, it's still cold. You would think, like, they're freezing. They, were, they, was, uh, they was running like it was 75 and sunny. Yeah. And I'm like... I'm like, we're in a dog fight. We're down by eight in the fourth quarter, and it's cold outside. How are we losing? Right? <laughs> so, yeah, um, I don't think it's going to affect them at all. I think they're going to come to play, and we got to get ready to play. Because we saw what happened to this, when they came up here. So it's like, okay, well, they're not phased by that. And the guys they have on their team, kind of Tyreek Hill played in Kansas City. So it's like, this is nothing new to him. And... Well, everybody else, I guess. You're right. <laughs> I know. I haven't looked at the weather forecast. Is it cold, snowy? Well, it's supposed to be, at- I think it's supposed to be like 34 degrees. But it's supposed yeah. to snow the night before or something like that. Like yesterday? Yeah. So, so it's not even like that. That's some people, I think people that aren't from Buffalo, they think it's 80 inches of snow all of the time. There's, there's, sometimes there's nice days and it's really not that bad. Hello. Hey. <laughs> Go Bills. Go Bills. <laughs> Squish the fist. <laughs> Good. Do we have any more questions? We might have time for one more. Got one over here. Oh, over there. Right there. Right there. Okay. To the left. Well, to your right. Gotcha. I was just wondering, what's your go-to like anthem or like hype song? <laughs> <laughs> hype song. You uh, do? Yeah, I don't have a hype song, but I've said it before. Um, I listen to Sam Smith before the game, like in my headphones when I'm on the field. That's what I'm listening to. So if anybody see me doing some dance, it's Sam Smith for some reason. Um, yeah, I listen to Sam Smith just to ease my mind, but not really a hype song. I don't think he hypes me up at all. Forty miles away by six. What? What Wait, what do you say? Say it again. <laughs> I don't want. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody, thanks so much for coming out tonight. This was phenomenal. Really appreciate it.
Let's give it up to Isaiah McKenzie. Eight episodes here at Misters. Yep, season two. Man, was... That was a lot of fun, Isaiah. Yeah. And I don't know, maybe we can talk you into doing one more. You know, they can, they can you know, throw some money your way or something. We'll make it happen. Ahead of a Super Bowl run. We don't know what's going to happen in the playoffs. You mean so. one more what? I don't, I don't want to. I don't want to make false promises here. So I, I, I'm going to. No, I mean, I'll shut myself I would, up. <laughs> I was trying to see, what, like, one more season. Uh, one more. Oh well. No, no. Because yeah. the thing is, I'm planning on retiring after the Super Bowl. So that's right. Isaiah is going to retire after the Bills win. You're going to have your first sip of alcohol. You said as well. Yeah, I do drugs. Yeah. I mean, don't no. do drugs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm. A, you know, but yeah, I'm. You know. Do a couple things. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's cut it off right there. No, that was great. Thanks so much, Isaiah. This is a lot of fun. He's going to hang out and uh, come up, meet Isaiah, say hi. And if you want to buy the blood and guts, how tight and say football, I'll be positioned over here too. So greatly appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>